My name is Delica Raduque, and I'm a member of the Diversity Council and the Diversity Expo Planning Committee. I want to welcome you for coming to ArtSpeak as part of the Diversity Expo Week. I'd like to hand over the podium to Julia Jaquette, a professor in the Fine Arts Department. Hi, everybody. I'm so pleased to be welcoming you all to our second Art Speak lecture, and it's featuring the artist Nalan Blake. So let me tell you a little bit about Nalan. His artwork has been exhibited extensively in the US and abroad, and is included in the collection of the Museum of, the, of Modern Art, the Whitney Museum, the Studio Museum of Harlem, uh, LA MOCA, and the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, among many. Um, in New York City, he is represented, or I should say his artwork is represented by the Matthew Marks Gallery, in London by the gallery called Fred, and in San Francisco by the gallery Paul Anglim. He is also a curator and a writer. In 1994, he curated In a Different Light, the first major museum exhibition to examine the impact of queer artists on, the con on contemporary art, and has written numerous catalog essays. Nayland is also an educator. He is the chair of the Master's Department of Advanced Photographic Studies at the International Center of Photography, BARD. And is, uh, and if that wasn't enough, he's also a DJ. You may end up seeing him behind the turntables, or really I should say CDs, um, at some art school or art world event. Personally, his combination of being an artist, a thinker, and an educator has been so inspiring and influential. You'll see in his work how he speaks about his life and his concerns, often with beautiful visual metaphor that is really poignant and compelling. So everybody, I give you Nalan Blake. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully someone else will show up who can live up to that, that introduction. Um, uh, if not, you're stuck with me. Uh, thank you, Julia, and and uh, thank you, FIT, for having me here. Um, it's great to finally be in this building. I grew up in New York, and so I've passed this building so many times, and uh, occasionally have gone to um, to uh, exhibitions, but have never been able to really see what the interior is like. So this is a real treat for me. So thank you for having me. Um, I am of the school where um, my tendency is to give you a lot to look at. So I know we only have an hour together, but um, I have around 200 pictures to show you. So we're going to go through things very quickly. But we're going to actually look at stuff that's, uh, we're going to go back almost 30 years. Um, and, uh, and I'll do a little bit of setup um, about these things, and then, we'll, and then the pace will pick up as we go through. Um, the little bit of setup is that I grew up uh, here in Manhattan, born in 1960. Um, I uh, went to public schools um, until uh, high school. And then uh, for college, I went to um, Bard. Uh, and uh, the thing, the first thing that I'm showing you are my final project from Bard. And one of the things that went on at the time, we're talking about 1982. So I really grew up seeing the New York art world of the 70s. And there were a few things about that art world. It was a time of, uh, there was a, a lot of enthusiasm for abstraction, for abstract painting and abstract sculpture. There was um, a, a lot of enthusiasm for large things. The idea was that you, you made really big pieces. And this was what was going on um, at Bard. If you were a good student, you made big oil paintings. Um, 
and uh, big abstract oil paintings. And I could never really figure out how to make those. I was always a person who made a lot of little things and a lot of little sort of anecdotal things that, that often had recognizable imagery in them. And I couldn't figure out um, how I could transition from these little things to the big things. Um, what I finally figured out um, towards the end of my time there, there were, I saw the work of a couple of artists, in fact, at a slide lecture much like this. I saw a slide lecture by um, an artist by the name of Judy Pfaff um, and one by an artist named uh, Jonathan Borofsky. And both of them were sort of pioneers of installation art. And both of them were making these pieces that were, um, they filled entire rooms with collections of sort of eccentric things that were all related to each other. And when I saw that, I realized that was how I could take all of my little things and make them into bigger, more complex things. I started out at BART as a film major. And I realized that what I could do was that I could start to treat the little things that I was making as individual shots and edit them together into a larger film that would be the installation. So I'm showing you a couple of pictures of my final project there. Um, and, uh, and you can sort of see here, um, it's a sort of chaotic environment. It was a black box theater, not on, uh, about half the size of this room, um, a, a little bit shorter, um, that I worked in for about a month just filling it up with stuff. And, uh, and I made this sort of guide room in the center um, that was a little place of calm in the midst of all the chaos uh, where you could go in and look at my preparatory drawings and my little notes for the pieces um, and sort of get a sense for what the outside chaos was all about. So that was about the big solution to my first problem. Um, we're going to skip ahead uh, about three or four years at this point. I graduated from Bard in 82. I went to the California Institute of Arts uh, in uh, Valencia, California in, uh, from 82 to 84 for my MFA. Um, and uh, I'm not going to actually show you any work from that period. I made a lot of stuff, um, but there was very little of it that actually um, was all that worthwhile looking at in the long run. And that's an interesting thing about working, and I think that people don't really talk about it so much. Um, when you go to a museum, you kind of see uh, the tip of the iceberg. You see what an artist, you know, you, you might see one piece out of a hundred that an artist has made. And so it seems like artists just go from making one um, intense thing to another. But there's a lot of times in your life when you're working and you're not necessarily generating things that are so fantastic. But you need to do that work in order to get to the next place. Um, and I think a really important uh, thing for artists to remember is that you have to do that work. You have to do that stuff. You can't leap over it um, as much as you would like to. Uh, it would be con much, so much more convenient to just make pertinent pieces all the time. But the truth is that there's a lot of time when you don't. Um, so there's basically three years worth of work here where I made a lot of stuff that ultimately I don't really show anybody. But I needed the experience. I needed to do it. So um, what I am showing you is um, around 1986. Uh, in San Francisco. After graduating in 84, I moved up to San Francisco, um, started working for a bit, um, and was invited to be part of a group show uh, at a nonprofit arts organization. And uh, I ended up, I had been generating a lot of different ideas in my work, but when the time came for me to have this show, which was really my first show in public, um, I ended up making a piece that was almost exactly the same as the piece that I did when I was graduating from Bard. So here was a problem. I made this big chaotic environment with, these, with all these drawings and all this other stuff, painted around, and um, 
this whole way of decoding it, and it was all very sort of ephemeral. And once you once the show came down, there weren't really any individual pieces. There was just the sort of all the stuff that had been connected together to make up the experience. Um, and I was really dissatisfied with that, and for two reasons. One. Um, it was frustrating to have done all this work and then to not have anything to look at to be able to think about in terms of going forward. But also, uh, when faced with a situation where I was um, presenting myself in public for the first time, I sort of got afraid and took a step back to something that felt secure to me, but was really, that I'd really gone past in terms of my working. So. I sat down, I started thinking about what I wanted to do next, and I gave myself some rules for the things that I wanted to make next. I decided that instead of doing big installations, I was going to go back to making small, discrete things, that those things had to make sense in and of themselves, and that I had to be willing to kind of look at them for a longer period of time, that, that it couldn't just be about having the show and having them be meaningful during the span of the show. They had to have some longer life. So this is the first work from that um, sequence that I'm showing you. And these are all sort of amended um, found objects, things that I had found in thrift stores or um, other places around San Francisco that I then reworked. Uh, this says lies to friends, lies about friends. Lapdog. Uh, this is a piece called Correction. The slate says I hated his hand there. With that body of work, I had this thing where I would find a sort of antique object, um, have a kind of evocative phrase, put them together and it felt like, oh, okay, something's happening, I've kind of got art. And what happened is that over the course of that year, it started to become a little formulaic. Uh, and I started to get very suspicious of that. And so um, I initiated this process as part of my working method where um, when there's something like that that seems like a strength, that seems like a success, I want to make sure that that doesn't turn into a crutch something that I'll just use over and over again. So um, what I do is I make some work that specifically looks at the thing that is successful, and I make some things that don't rely on it at all. So um, in thinking about the sort of language object thing, I realize that whenever we encounter an object, we are encountering it through language. I didn't need to put words on things to have us think about language in relationship to them. We're always coming to them with the category of language. So I made some things that didn't, that, that worked with the language that was already in our head. Um, these were these sort of substance pieces. So this is um, water, wine, vinegar, piss. Um, this is a piece called After Veronica. And it's a series of men's handkerchiefs that have been stained with a variety of substances and then framed and tagged. Um, then taking that, then I, I'd made some things that were specifically about looking at language itself. So I started making these sign paintings. This is a piece called March. Um, for the month of March, um, 1987, I had one apple a day, um, and then I preserved the apple cores in vodka and uh, tagged them with the date. So it's a whole, it's, it's the 31 apple cores. A piece called 500 Kisses. There's two sets of cards. Um, one says fluid on one side and final on the other. One says safe and, and then seen on the other side. And uh, at the beginning of the show, I pitched half of them towards the hat, and then the rest were there for the uh, people who were looking at the show to pitch. That, uh, the sort of process that was involved in those pieces, led me to start thinking about making some objects that um, could be of use in other ways. So they started, I started thinking about these kind of kit pieces where you would get a whole bunch of materials to accomplish an action.
I started to get suspicious of the sort of antique look of the things. Everything had this sort of patina of age. So I wanted to make some things that were that were contemporary looking. So that led to these um, workstation pieces. Uh, this is workstation one restraint. Restraint chair. Device for burning bees and sugar, flush. And then um, trying to get rid of the antique look of the sign paintings, they switched into these uh, chalk board silkscreen pieces. So these are two different translations of the same passage of uh, Leopold von Sacher Massach's Venus and Furs. And uh, the thing that I liked about them is that they're both these descriptions of this painting, and there's some third painting there that's kind of hovering between the two as you kind of look at the two different descriptions. You have your own version that you're constructing in your head. This is from a flyer that I found called The Many Faces of Addiction. I, I never really understood what it was about codeine that it, offer, you know, that it occupies the nexus of all addiction. <laughs> It's like, don't worry about the morphine or the Demerol or the Percocet. It's the codeine that you got to watch out for. <laughs> there's another one of these that's a, where there's a third Duran and added. Then uh, sort of taking a look at the specifically antique uh, uh, look of, of some of the earlier pieces, I did um, the first of a series of what are called um, suites. These are installations of, of um, pieces that I make and pieces uh, that I uh, find in an institution um, that are all related to a specific text. This is um, the Schreber Suite. Um, from 1989 at the uh, University Art Museum, Berkeley, California. Another workstation piece. Uh, three separate uh, pieces. Um, a mirror restraint on the on the wall. Um, uh, uh, a um, workstation piece on the floor, and then a piece called self poisoning kit on the uh, on the left hand side there. Um, on the table is a um, uh, the series of jars that have water, um, apricots, strychnine, and there's a little mill to grind them up and a, and a dish to eat them out of. A piece called Schatzman Hallucination Guide. So um, we went from the silk screens on the chalkboards to silk screening directly on the wall and then leaving the screen there so that you had uh, the piece sort of had the record of its own making. Those first pieces that I showed you that had like the lies to friends, lies about friends, all that stuff, um, were, I said that I had made those pieces while I was at uh, in thrift stores and I do a lot of that. I do a lot of shopping. Um, but. As you can see in the more recent and in, in going forward in those pieces, they started to get pretty elaborately fabricated. Um, and I started to miss that thing of just being able to go into the thrift store and find some stuff and put it together. So I started making these pieces, which are mass market paperbacks encased in plexiglass boxes and mounted on the walls. And there's some close-ups, but I'll, I'll give you a sense of what's in them. So the one on the left is Larry Kramer's book, Faggots, The Hobbit, The Hobbit, The Hobbit, Faggots. So that one's sort of Faggots and Hobbits. Um, then there's um, The Exorcist, uh, The Omen, uh, The Omen 2, The Exorcist, The Omen 2, The Exorcist. Um, the third one is all these Eric Von Daniken books. He was this guy who came up with this theory that ancient astronauts built the pyramids or like can, you know, that all these uh, Neolithic artifacts were around to show that aliens had come down and, you know, picked up the whatever not so bright humans that were there and convinced them to, like, you know, build canals and giant structures and pictures of men and stuff on the ground. And so those are all of his books and all the books refuting him. Um, and then on the, on the right hand side is um, the Christine Jorgensen story, the Iliad, the James Coco diet, the trouble with Tribbles, and the Christine Jorgensen story. Mm -mm. No. They're, I mean, they're a really weird combination. And actually, there's another inspiration for these. 
which is that um, if you look at Andy Warhol's um, box sculptures these days, um, usually they're shown with these form-fitting plexi boxes around them, which is completely antithetical to what those sculptures are about. So they're like weird slip covers. And I, I remember seeing those in the show and I thought, this is like ridiculous. So these are, no, once the books are in there, I mean, they're all books that I've read, but you can't ever remove them again. Um, once the books are in there, they're in there. But, you know, there's these holes in the back, so they aren't even archival. It's not, you know, it's like, it's, it's this weird sort of combination of like putting something on a pedestal, but really, you know, letting it decay as well. Um, those, uh, those book pieces turn into these poster pieces with CDs mounted on them. That led to this commission for uh, something called Art Against AIDS on the Road, where artists, and we're talking about 1991 at this point, um, this is artists working on projects for uh, bus shelters and advertising vehicles around, uh, around San Francisco. So this was for a bus shelter in San Francisco. Um, terrible, terrible slide, but it's the only image I have of it, unfortunately. This was a commission done for various AIDS fundraisers. It's called Every 12 Minutes. So the, you know, the silk, silk screening the stuff on the walls, that led to these letter pieces. Um, this is 1990 in New York, um, a show at the Petersburg Gallery. I heard that um, actually David Lee Roth's family showed up and were really excited that he was having a show and then really disappointed that he wasn't. A transport piece, a piece called uh, Dual Restraint Head Hog Tie. Uh, this is a canvas restraint piece. It's about um, seven feet tall. Again, it's a little bit hard to tell the scale from these. This is about um, 12 feet by 12 feet. Dual restraint. Um, that then led into a whole series of these puppet pieces, the wall-mounted puppet stage. Little box, you pull the tassel up, um, and inside is a head of uh, Punch from Punch and Judy with a custom blended uh, perfume in it. Uh, again, some of these things are a little bit, uh, are going to take a little bit too long to describe to you. So this is a video piece from around then called Negative Bunny, um, where this bunny spends um, a half an hour explaining to you how negative he is. <laughs> He's really negative. A piece called Magic. This is Waylon Flowers' puppet, Madam. Again, looking at the, how sort of elaborate and, and big those uh, last pieces were, I wanted to make some things that were sort of smaller and incidental. These are these bouquet pieces. They're um, willow letters and artificial flowers. A uh, piece called the 70s, actual size mix. So it's one, uh, one album from each year from 1969 to 1980. So now we're around 92. This is a piece called Homunculus. That last piece and this piece were made for an exhibition um, in London. At the back of this slide, there's um, a little hot plate there. Um, basically, what happened with this piece was this structure was empty at the beginning of the show. And during the course of the show, during the hours that the gallery was in operation, I was in the space. Um, melting down chocolate and casting these heads and mounting them on the spikes. So, um, so I was there physically and there was a sort of constant process and smell of cooking and a piece called Arena. So the puppet pieces started turning into these um, kind of hood pieces that then turn into these uh, suit pieces, uh, heavenly bunny suit. A uh, piece called The Little One. This is a, a multiple 
Um, this is what it looks like dressed and undressed. It's a bisque doll. A uh, piece called Equipment for a Shameful Epic. It's basically all of the material that you need, all the props and costumes that you need to stage a script. Um, which is, you can see that in the binder on the rack there. Um, it's a script that I wrote myself that's a combination of the Pinocchio story and a few other things and the Watergate transcript. Another one of these performance in the gallery things, uh, I did this show where you could buy, um, you could order things in advance and I would make them for you during the show and give them to you. So um, if you ordered this piece, you would get a half an hour, uh, you would get an hour of my time in this bunny suit sort of chained up in this, in this bower. And we'd videotape the hour and give it to you. Uh, reversible bunny suit. Um, another one of these suite installations, this is called the Philosopher's Suite. The script uh, that it deals with is Philosophy in the Bedroom by the Marquis de Sade. And there's a sort of series of different um, productions of it. So this is stuff from the marionette production. Here's some of the marionettes. And then another piece called uh, Invisible Man, another one of these big installations. Here the script is a combination of um, Harvey, the play and film, whoops, and, um, and Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. Now we're about 95. This is a show in Los Angeles. It needs a little bit of setup. Um, uh, it's shot kind of low. It's a little bit hard to get the scale. Basically the tallest thing in the room are those trees and they're about 14 inches tall. So you walk into the space and you're kind of towering over everything else. It, it varies from piece to piece. I didn't sew these bunnies, for example. These I found. Um, yeah, those, there, some of those I sewed, some of them I, I, you know, I worked with someone else who's a better uh, seamstress than I am. So, um, most of the stuff I had, like I made the refrigerator, for example. Um, most of the stuff I know how to do Usually, it's a, it's, it, it's a question of is it better to have somebody else who can really do it quickly and easily, and I sort of know what instructions to give them for it. This is a commission for the main branch of the public library in San Francisco. It's a piece called Constellation. Um, basically, this is looking across the main atrium of the, of the library. Um, the piece is that green bar that's going up the center. Um, it looks like this sort of collection of lights when you're across the way. When you get onto that walkway, you can see that um, what they actually are are a series of mirrors that have been etched with the names of various authors who are in the library's collection. Um, and they're illuminated from behind. So you see the name twice, once as a light that comes through the mirror and once as a shadow that's reflected back onto the wall from the, from the reflecting side of the mirror. And then on the back side of the wall, you see that the illumination is a series of fiber optic tubes that go to various points. Around the same time that I was working on that, I was also working on this piece, another big, uh, another big installation called Hair Hole. Around this time, I got started drawing again a lot. And it's something that I had been doing in a kind of sketchbook way, but hadn't really been paying attention to making drawings. So this actually, this show got me back into making drawings in a, much, uh, in a much more consistent way, and it's something that I continue to do these days. Yeah. So this, at this point, we're around 97. Um, I moved in 96, I moved back to New York from San Francisco. Uh, and around this time I was commissioned to do a performance as part of BAM's uh, Visual Arts in Action series. So this is part of a show called Hair Follies. Uh, it's myself, Ishmael Houston-Jones, and Patricia Hofbauer. 
One of the things that I do when I get stuck is I give myself assignments. So um, occasionally that assignment will be to make a piece a day. Um, this is a show from uh, 98 at uh, Gallery Paula Anglum called April Hair. Uh, it's one piece a day for the month of April. So this is the first piece, um, Clown White Target, Dual Surrender, uh, Erased Space Jam Bootleg, back when you used to get bootleg movies on, on VCR cassettes. Like, how old am I? Um, Gray Bunny Made As Tall As Me By Stretching Its Neck. Uh, shit Molding Kit. Uh, and this is, I'm not showing you all uh, 30 days of April, but this is the last one, um, Burnt Cork Target. Uh, then from the next year, uh, this is a piece called Feeder 2. Uh, gingerbread and steel, it's about 7 by 7 by 10 feet. That was paired with a video um, uh, uh, called Gorge, um, that's a one hour video that's pretty much this same shot for the hour. During the course of the hour I'm being fed a variety of things um, by this same other, uh, other man. I've done this several times subsequently as a performance where um, I'm seated in front of a table of food and the audience is able to feed me over the course of the hour. And I'll basically eat whatever they, they present me with. Um, after, uh, after seeing those two things together, my mom had like the, the you know, uh, the, the sort of this really interesting comment where um, she said, well, you know, watching that video was really hard. And I was like, well, I understand, you know, it's kind of rough. And she said, well, it was just the variety of things that you were eating. I mean, I could see eating the gingerbread for an hour. So this magazine sort of commissioned me, this interiors magazine commissioned me to do a piece. And I decided that what I would do is I would panel my mom's bedroom in gingerbread for the month. So there's mom, there's her, there's her bedroom, that's gingerbread on the walls. She said it, she said she slept better than she had in ages. A uh, piece called uh, Steel Cage Match, now we're around um, 2000. I started doing these very large drawings, about five feet tall by, this is about eight feet long. I'm sort of racing through here. I hope we're doing okay on where are we at on time? Oh yeah, we gotta we gotta step it up. Piece called Server. Those are it's about twelve feet tall, angel food cake and tar and steel. This is uh uh, the part of another installation that has to do with another videotape called Starting Over. Basically that suit is the weight of uh, the person who was my uh, boyfriend at the time. I'm wearing tap shoes. Uh, when we film this there are two microphones. There's a microphone that's out in the space. There's a microphone that's under the platform. So when I have the suit on, it's our combined weights, which, are, which is over 400 pounds. Um, basically, the videotape is him teaching me a dance. Um, and, uh, and you can hear each time my foot hits the platform, it's this loud pound from the tap shoe. Um, and I basically am going through learning the dance and doing it until I can't physically do it anymore goes on for about 28 minutes or so. Um, this is a piece called Ruins of a Sensibility. It's my vinyl record collection um, with this DJ setup and basically whenever the piece is shown people are free to sign up for DJ sessions using my records. Um, that painting on the back wall is uh, one of my earliest memories. It's a painting that I made with my father when, we were, when I was around four. So it's always been in my parents' living room. Here's another smaller gingerbread house, um, part of a collaborative project with A.A. Um, with a. A. Bronson. So he did, the, he did the mirror pieces on the back wall, and then I had the house in the front. Um, there, through the wall, you can see a video uh, piece of ours called Coat.
two-channel video. Uh, now we're around 2004, so I'll step it up again. Um, series of pieces, uh, dual stem pipe. Uh, this is a piece called Triple Surrender. These are three white-on-white -white Confederate flags. Another, another big drawing. Uh, this is a piece called The Big One. Um, bunny suit, and uh, this will give you a sense of the scale of it. It's about 16 feet. I can assure you that I did not sew that. Um, so this here, um, that's uh, a multiple, it's this debossed print, and that's the image that's there in the center. A piece called Failed Utopias. Uh, we decided to make a little gorge lunchbox. Um, here's a selection of some of the drawings from around that time. Uh, and then a show from uh, 2006 at Fred in London. Autographed Al Pacino photograph, piece called Endless Comfort. It's about seven feet tall. And then a piece from San Francisco, a show from San Francisco the following year, the sign piece. Around this time, I got started being more interested in doing pieces that didn't necessarily rely on galleries or didn't rely on the sort of standard art distribution method. And I started making these pieces that are. I call them gift tags. It's basically, I find stuff, it's basically drawing on garbage. So I'll find a piece of garbage, I'll draw on it, and then I'll put it back where I found it. And it's kind of a gift for the next person. And it, around the same time I started doing some performances, um, using Craigslist that were, you know, just stuff that was uh, more or less kind of invisible. And generally I don't show the documentation from these in anything or, um, but they really are just this way of making stuff um, that happens in a kind of ongoing way. Uh, this is a piece, it's a necklace made out of things that I found walking my dog every morning for the for a month of October, two years ago. So I was sort of out there, you know, walking my dog, being bummed out that my neighborhood was so messy. And then I just asked myself the question, well, you know, instead of complaining about it, what can I do about it? So started making them into pieces. Uh, this is a show from a couple of years ago. So you can see that the stuff has really um, in some ways changed. I think of these as really kind of abstract sculptures that don't have a whole narrative uh, or, or a symbolic relationship to anything. They're really about working with the materials and finding a way for the, interior, the materials to kind of go together. Those are their plexiglass. Uh, they're, they're various layers of colored and mirrored plexiglass um, that have been scraped and gouged into. And so they're these re reworked mirrors that are, it's, uh, you know, I think of them as paintings, but there's not a whole lot of paint applied to them. They're really, um, they're really paintings that are made by subtraction or abrasion. And then these are these uh, sort of bead pieces. These kind of harken back to the bouquet pieces in a way. Beads and other found materials. This is about um, nine feet long. It's a little bit hard to tell the scale. This is the last piece I'm going to show you. It, it was for a project at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard. I was invited to be part of this show um, 
working with the Hessel Collection. Bard's curatorial studies program is built around the collection of one particular um, patron. And so um, this is called the Hessel Collection Collection. Basically what I did was I took the database that the curatorial, that the museum has on their collection, in other words, the listing of every object that they have, um, and looked at uh, the notes that they had for each thing, and then did a Google image search on those terms, and pulled images from online um, that came up in the search. So it was sort of my way of getting my own version of the collection, which is like 1,700 things. But like the thing on the end that says blood mania, you know, that might have started out with a description of a piece by Kiki Smith, say, that had blood in it, you know, in the title. Um, so it was this way of kind of making this other really kind of phantasmagorical collection out of the stuff that was already there. So, that's the last one. How are we on time? Oh my God, 2.22, we have, we have eight minutes for questions. So, um, we, can, we can bring the lights up and I can hopefully answer some stuff. Yes? It's, it's the big question. Although I gotta say, like now, I mean, there's, there, this time around there's a lot less bunny, right? I mean, those of you who have seen the lecture before. Um, um, you know, basically the way that I tend to work and the, the way that I make things is that I'll have a kind of vague idea about something that I wanna make, something that I wanna see, and I'll start making an object. I might have a vague idea about a drawing. Something catches my eye and I make a drawing of it. And then I look at the stuff that I make and I go, what does this remind me of? Where have I seen this image before? Why did this come up? So at one point, I was doing these performances. Um, this is in the late 80s. I was doing these performances where I was reading these texts and I was, a and I was, had to be in some sort of a costume. I had made up this rule for myself. And the costume that I was usually using was some sort of a prom dress. Um, and by the late 80s, like, you know, kind of hairy guys in prom dresses were getting, it was getting a little played out. <laughs> um, so I thought, I need another costume for these performances. And I was doing one in LA, and I walked past this costume shop and magic shop, and they had a bunny costume. And I thought, oh great, you know, this piece that I'm doing is all about magic. I'll be like sort of the magician's bunny. So that was the first thing. I bought this bunny suit and did the performance in the bunny suit. And then I started to ask myself, okay, where have I seen this before? Why was this so appealing to me? And it started to crop up in some other drawings and I started to think, okay, um, you know, uh, when I was a kid, um, my, uh, my grandfather, um, used to, uh, and, and my dad used to read Uncle Wiggly's stories and, um, and, uh, and uh, Br'er Rabbit stories to me. And I started looking at those stories and thinking about that character of Br'er Rabbit, that kind of trickster rabbit character, and started doing some research on it. So I started making some drawings that were kind of about, okay, rabbits are um, in some ways sort of racially, well, that character, that Br'er Rabbit character, comes to America with slaves. Those tales, those Br'er Rabbit stories, are East African folk tales. I mean, West African folk tales. So those characters came to the U.S. with slaves, even though the Joel Chandler Harris version of it that we have is this weird kind of debased version of it. He was hearing those stories from people um, who, uh, you know, he was hearing them from African Americans. So I started making some work that was about that relationship, that character coming into America and, and having a kind of ambivalent racial identity. And then I started thinking about Bugs Bunny and the way that in Bugs Bunny cartoons, you know, he often appears in drag. There's a whole sort of gender ambivalence there. He's also a gray rabbit. 
He's um, he he's often like playing banjo. You know, he'll like be singing songs, and those songs are things like "Oh Susanna" and "Camp Town Races," which are basically minstrel songs. Um, so the this whole his whole identity as a character that is, you know perched in between genders and in between races became really important to me. So then when I was working on the Harvey Invisible Man piece, I thought, okay, I'm going to look at these two things. And then I realized that there was a family photograph of me with a stuffed rabbit. So I went looking for that photograph. And in the midst of looking for that photograph, I found this other photograph of me as a kid with a, a live rabbit. And then I remembered that I had had, like at, at age four or five, um, I'd been given a, a rabbit, as many kids were around Easter, and that it had killed itself. Um, and I, I tell you that whole story because I think that that's the way that content actually works in art. Normally, in art school, you're trained to go, like, you're trained to find your issue. So if you ask me, like, why is there a bunny in your work? Well, when I was a kid, I had this bunny who died, and it's this trauma that stayed with me, blah, 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 and that's what I make work about. You know, it's like, find your issue and explicate your issue. Then you're doing your job as an artist. I believe it works exactly the opposite. I was doing all of this research and stuff, into really abstruse things, and it led me to the memory. You don't know the contents of your own life yet. And by externalizing it and then looking at how those external things operate, you can start to come to some understanding of what's inside of you, what's really inside of you. Because when people do this thing about having the issue and owning it, it's all about doing it in a way that someone else has already done it. So my big problem in grad school, like one of the reasons why I don't show you this stuff from, from um, CalArts, is uh, I was really concerned with the problem in 1982 of how do you make gay art? You know, I'm like a guy who's like sleeping with other guys. How do I make art about, that is gay but isn't just beefcake? Like no, normally that was the model that was there at the time was the art that was recognizably gay, and this is hard to, I think, for people to understand, but one of the huge things that happened in the AIDS epi epi epidemic is that people started listening to gay people in a very different way. It used to be that if someone, if your work betrayed you as being gay, it meant that you were not worthy of serious consideration as an artist, because you were someone who was driven by your genitals, period, right? All of that changed in relationship to the epidemic when people started talking about mortality, started talking about inequities in social systems. And it's very difficult for us to kind of leap back. But when I was, you know, at the, in, in that point in the early 80s when I was trying to figure out, like, how do you make gay art, that language was not yet available. So I kept trying to think of, like, okay, well, this is my issue, but the only way to do it was this way that was already recognizably out there. I had to throw all of that out and say that whatever it is that I'm making has some relationship to queer identity, has some relationship to race, you know, as I start to talk about being um, a, 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 an interracial person, it's like, how do you talk about that in a way that is not merely um, a retread of what's already out there? So I promise not every answer to every question will be that long. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, the short answer is no and no, and it, it and it and the 
And the long answer is that um, for the most part, not to be snarky here, I am an, I am an academic. Um, academic theorists are most comfortable talking about queers who are dead or off stage because then they can make up whatever story they want about them and they don't have to like deal with someone who might say, no, you kind of got that wrong. <laughs> you know, that's, I mean, that's a horrible, terrible way to put it and there are many nice people, many of them are my friends, et cetera, et cetera, but it happens around art history conferences. CAA, the College Art Association, um, is more comfortable with artists who aren't really in attendance um, because then they can say whatever they need to say about them. It's the, the role of the artist is sort of to provide the content, the material upon which they can theorize. Sure, well, it's always, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's harder. So, I, I mean, you know, that's, I, again, this is like a terrible snarky thing to say, but um, I, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, it's just, it's easier to say something about someone who isn't around to contradict you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. I was just curious. Um, I don't know whether there's a gay element in all of your art or isn't, but when you're making it, do you sometimes make decisions not to have it in there or have it in there or some of it in there? Um, you know, that just makes me think of like, what's the, what's, what's that, the thing in, um, What's the song in, uh, is it in Sleeping Beauty, or what's the, Alakazula, Pitravula, Bibbidi Babadu? Like, like, it's not like I'm dancing around the studio like, ah, we'll have, we'll have a pinch of race, and we'll have, like, we'll, you know, we'll throw some gay in there, and we'll have some gender theory. And, um, you know, I think, and, and this happens a lot when people talk about political art. I think it makes most, the most sense not to talk about those things as ingredients, but to talk about them as lenses through which you can view the art. So the way that I could come to an understanding, like everything that you've seen here can be read through a queer lens. Everything that you can see here can be read through a racial lens, right? Those early pieces that had the things connected by chains and everything, you know, that took on a really different resonance when I looked back over my work and said, okay, instead of trying to make a piece about race, what if I say that all these pieces are about race? What are they telling me? You know, what is an interest in um, in, uh, in bondage and restraint mean for someone who has a family history of slavery. So I think when you do that, when you make it the lens and say, talk about this as a political piece, you start to come to a richer understanding of what politics might mean, what sexuality might mean, what spirituality might mean. You know, it's something that I often do with my students. I say, all right, talk about this piece as a spiritual piece. What is it saying? It's not like there's no decision about spirituality here. You know, it's not, and, and this is the thing that happens so much where I'm so glad that we're here talking about diversity because when we get stuck in that idea that there are issues it, then we get this idea that it's different people's jobs to talk about different issues right so it's not queer people's job to talk about race they're here to talk about sex you know and if they start talking about race or they start talking about class people are like what are you talking about you know, it's incomprehensible, and vice versa. Which often leaves my, for lack of a better term, straight white students, straight white male students coming to me like, I don't know what to make work about. I don't have an issue. 
you know. <laughs> it's like, what's that thing that Homer Simpson says? I'm a white male, 38 to 42. Everybody listens to what I say. <laughs> you know, it's that, it, and, and we're all constantly making decisions about race, about class, about sex, about economic relationships, about spirituality, about politics. But they don't look like the big grandstanding things that we're trained to think of as that. So we go like, okay, well, I don't have any politics in my work. But if you say, okay, what are the politics that are operating here? Then you start to get to a place of actual diversity where it's not like everybody is just doing their assignment, but where you get to hear what each person actually thinks about things. So um, that's a long way of saying no. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't think like, oh, I should gay this one up or get the tone down the gay on that one. You know, it's like, to me, it's all about how you read it. And one of the reasons why I love doing these talks is it gives me a chance to look back over the span of 30 years and see stuff pop out that I didn't think of before. And sometimes it's formal stuff, and sometimes it's political stuff, and sometimes it's autobiographical stuff. But that's the joy of it, of those things all being made, because I can keep going back to them and seeing new things. Are we pro we're probably... That was long. Thank you, guys. <laughs>